It is truly great to see everyone here tonight. Let me tell you something about messing up before a congregation. If I had a dollar for every time I have butchered the English language or misreferenced the scripture, I could retire with no problems at all. So it's just uh, normal for us from time to time to, to mess up when we're before uh, the people of God trying to, to do what's right. And I appreciate all the men, the young men here that are willing to take a leadership position and to to lead this congregation in worship and do the things that we do here. We have the latest episodes of the Johnny Robertson program, What Does the Bible Say in the Foyer? If you want a copy of that, you can take one of those. They're on the table. Also, I want to remind everyone of our Family Bible School, June 25th through the 28th, and it's uh, referenced here on the brochure, which I just noticed we got the wrong year on it. Talk about messing up. It's got 2005 on it. <laughs> My secretary messed that up. So. But uh, I would have done the same thing. I couldn't do near as good a job as she could as, as far as putting something like this together. But it doesn't take someone that's brilliant to make that five into a six, to make it 2006. So... That's something that can be easily corrected. And we have those there so we can pass out to people and invite them. It's an opportunity for them to uh, get to hear the gospel. It is for all ages. The theme is going to be King of Kings. We're going to be study, studying royalty in the Bible. Next Sunday night service will be moved to 730. And then Monday through Wednesday, it's going to be 730 every night. And Sunday, King David and King Solomon will be discussed. Sunday morning at 10.30, King David will be talked about. I will preach that lesson or give that lesson. And Sunday night, King Solomon will be Sunday night. Monday night, um, King Hezekiah will be discussed. Brian Hodge of Marshall, Texas. Tuesday night, King Nebuchadnezzar, Sam Delbeck of Leonard, Texas. And then Wednesday night, Jesus Christ, King of Kings, Cody Westbrook, of Fruitvale, Texas, who is no stranger to us. So we will be looking forward to that. Be praying for that effort as we try to glorify God and teach the young people and those who are older the will of God. We're looking in the Old, in the Old Testament to the book of Jeremiah. We're going through every book of the Old Testament looking at these promises and prophecies about Jesus Christ. We are now to what's been labeled the weeping prophet. The reason why he is called the weeping prophet is because you find throughout the book of Jeremiah him weeping, not because he was weak, but because he was sad over the condition of God's people. God's people had departed from God, and that saddened Jeremiah. He was a very tender-hearted individual. In fact, he wrote the next book, Lamentations, which means to lament or to mourn. So Jeremiah authored the book of Jeremiah and the book of Lamentations that follows the book bearing his name. Jeremiah was a prophet from the year 627 B.C. to 580 B.C. He was a contemporary of Zephaniah, Habakkuk, Daniel, and Ezekiel. Oftentimes God would have various prophets living at the same time in various places speaking the will of God to the people. And he was a contemporary of those prophets that we will look at later on as we go through the Old Testament. There are 52 chapters in Jeremiah, and there are a few references to Christ and the New Covenant. Let me give you a brief outline of the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 1 through 25 is the condemnation of Judah. He is preaching to Judah, the southern kingdom, preaching to them, condemning them for their sin and immorality. Jeremiah 26 through 29, the conflicts of Jeremiah. The conflicts that he faces as he is telling the truth, but he meets resistance. Jeremiah 30 through 33, the future restoration of Judah, where he prophesies that after 70 years of Babylonian captivity, a remnant would return and be reestablished in the land. 
Jeremiah 34 through 45, you have the fall of Jerusalem. The fall of the city of Jerusalem. Jeremiah 46 through 51, you have Jeremiah bringing condemnation on nine nations. Nine nations. And Jeremiah chapter 52, you have the concluding historical events of what took place concerning the people of God going into Babylonian captivity for their sins. It's very interesting in Jeremiah chapter 1 that he is called as a young man. And God says, before I knew you, before you were born, I called you, I have known you, and I sanctified you to be a prophet to the nations. A prophet to the nations. So he was not only a prophet to Judah, the people of God, but to the nations. And that's why you find him condemning nine nations in the book because he's preaching to them concerning their sins against God. And as I said before, there's not a whole lot as far as um, prophecies about Jesus Christ and New Testament Christianity, but you do find a few passages and we're going to look at that tonight. Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23. One of the problems that Judah, as the people of God, faced was that their leadership, their shepherds, were not shepherding the people. And Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 1 through 6, Jeremiah is going to talk about that problem. As God is speaking through him. If you remember Jeremiah chapter 1, Jeremiah said, I'm just a young man. How are they going to listen to me? In essence, that's what he said. And God says, I will give you my words. And what I give to you, you preach to the people. So God is speaking through the prophet Jeremiah. Look at verse 1 of Jeremiah chapter 23. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel against the shepherds who feed my people. You have scattered my flock, driven them away, and are not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for the evil of your doings, says the Lord. Verse 3, But I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them, and bring them back to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. That's talking about the remnant returning after the 70 years of captivity in Babylon. Verse 4, I will set up shepherds over them who will feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, nor shall there be any lack, says the Lord. He's going to set up shepherds who are going to be faithful in feeding the flock. We read about some of those shepherds. Ezra and Nehemiah were some of those shepherds who were faithful in feeding the flock of God after they had returned back from their captivity. Verse 5, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise up to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is the name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. Or literally, Yahweh, our righteousness. Here in verses 5 and 6, we have a prophecy about Jesus Christ. As he is talking about the shepherds who are not doing their job, he's talking about the shepherds who have the responsibility to tend to the flock. However, he says to them in verse 1, Woe to these shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. He says, you scatter the flock, you do not attend to them. And he says, behold, in verse 2, I will attend to you for the evil of your doings. The leadership, the shepherds, the ones who were supposed to be the spiritual leaders of Judah, were not doing their job. They were not shepherding God's people. There are many, many lessons that we can learn from that. We know from the New Testament pattern 
that every congregation of God's people is to have a qualified eldership. And that eldership is to pastor or shepherd that congregation. It's not the preacher's job to pastor the church or to shepherd the church. It is the eldership's job to do that. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1, we see the qualifications of those who would be shepherds in God's church. And in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, the Apostle Paul solemnly charges the elders at Ephesus. And he says, therefore, take heed to yourself, to all the flock, that's the church, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd or pastor the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. And when shepherds do not do that, when elders do not shepherd the church, they do much damage. The sheep are scattered. That means they are driven further away from God. They are to be attended to, as he says in Jeremiah 23 and verse 2. That word attend means to be taken care of. You see the need of the sheep. Perhaps it is wounded. Perhaps it needs to be uh, bathed. It needs to be taken care of. It needs to be nourished. And the shepherds aren't doing it. And God says, woe unto you. For being my shepherds. However, you're not fulfilling your obligation to attend to the sheep. I believe that that is the problem in some churches of Christ where there are men who claim to be elders. However, they're not shepherding the sheep. That is why false teaching is filtering in. That is why immorality is in the congregation because the elders aren't shepherding. And the sheep gather together on Sunday but then on Monday they go out and they scatter into the world and they act just like the world. Immorality, false doctrine, people living in adultery within the congregation. And elders not doing a thing about it. I was talking to an elder not long ago that was supposed to be, supposed to be a shepherd of God's people concerning the matter of instrumental music and worship. And I asked him, is that wrong? And he said, I've never even thought of it. This is supposed to be an elder of God's people who's never even considered whether instrumental music and worship is wrong. He said, well, we don't do it here at the congregation where he's supposed to be an elder. But he says, I've never really thought whether it's right or wrong. An elder. That's what's wrong with some churches of Christ. That's why they're swelling in some numbers, yet they're weak spiritually. Woe to those shepherds. They're not tending to God's flock. They're not doing their job in teaching and in instructing and, and loving the flock and disciplining the flock when it needs to be disciplined. Men should not be appointed who are not qualified and men should not be appointed who will not do the work of shepherding God's people. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1-4. through 4. The apostle Peter, Peter, who was an elder himself, not only an apostle, he was an elder of the church. First Peter chapter five, verses one through four. Peter gives instructions to the elders. He says, the elders who are among you, I exhort. I, who am a fellow elder and a witness of the suffering of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, shepherd the flock of God. They are to be shepherds of God's people. They are to take care of. That word shepherd is the word for pastor. They are the pastors of the church. They are the shepherd to take care of, to attend to the flock, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory, that does not fade away. That takes us back to Jeremiah chapter 23. The prophecy about the one who would come. Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse 5. He says, Behold, the days are coming. He's talking about the New Testament time. Says the Lord, 
that I will raise to David a righteous branch or a branch of righteousness. To David, he's talking about to the family of David. And we've seen in other books how that Christ is a descendant of King David. And that from the family of David, of the tribe of Judah, of the nation of Israel, would come one, Jesus Christ, and he would be a branch of righteousness. He would be one who would descend from King David according to the flesh. He shall be king, verse 5, and shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In John chapter 10, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep. He is the chief shepherd. The elders are of a congregation are shepherds of a local congregation. However, the chief shepherd, the universal shepherd of the church is Jesus Christ. He is the head of the body. And he shall reign as king. He is king of kings and lord of lords. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 15. He has authority, all authority, in heaven and on earth. Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse 6. In his day, Judah shall be saved. That was the purpose of Jesus to come into the world. That's why he came. To seek and to save that which was lost. And he says, Israel will dwell safely and his name shall be called the Lord our righteousness or Yahweh our righteousness. We are made right because of Jesus Christ. We are made righteous because of his death upon the cross. And as a result of this branch, a righteous branch that comes from David, the king, we can be righteous before God. He is the chief shepherd. And the shepherds of the church need to take that very seriously. Because Peter said in 1 Peter 5 and verse 4, when the chief shepherd appears to those faithful elders, to those faithful elders who truly did shepherd God's people, he says, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. What a reward will be for those faithful elders. Thank God for them who are willing to have a backbone and shepherd God's people, to love God's truth, God's church, and the Lord Jesus Christ enough to do their job of shepherding God's people. Woe to those elders who will not. Who for big buildings and large numbers and the almighty dollar will compromise. Woe unto them. Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31. Verses 31 through 34. In Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, you have Jeremiah, an Old Testament prophet, prophesying of a new covenant that would come. Notice the phraseology is very similar as he starts off. It's very similar to Jeremiah 23 in verse 5. Jeremiah 31, verse 31. Behold, the days are coming. That's talking about the New Testament. Behold, the days are coming when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Verse 34. No more shall every man teach his neighbor or every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. The prophecy about the new covenant, that that righteous branch that would come from David would establish. He says the days are coming, says the Lord. He's going to make a new covenant. He's talking about the New Testament there in verse 31. With the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. 
And he says it's going to be different, verse 32. It's not going to be according to the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I delivered them with my hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. That's what Moses did as he delivered the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage to take them to the promised land. And that law was given at Mount Sinai. And Jeremiah is saying there's going to be a new covenant and it's not going to be according to the old covenant. It's going to be a different covenant. It's going to be different. He says that covenant that I made with them at Mount Sinai, verse 32, they broke. Keep that in mind. They didn't keep the covenant. They broke it. They violated the law of God. He says, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. They were my bride. I was their husband. Yet the covenant that I made with them, they broke. God doesn't break his covenants. People do. They broke the covenant. Notice verse 33. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. That covenant of the New Testament. Says the Lord God. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. God's word would be in their minds and in their hearts. And it says God would write them in our minds and in our hearts. You remember that when God gave the Ten Commandment law, that he wrote it himself at Mount Sinai. God wrote the law on the two tablets himself. Under the New Testament, he says, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. Well, how does that happen? Is that direct? Is that miraculous? Is that in some way that he puts the law into our minds that we have it in a way that uh, we don't have to study? We just set back and let the mi our minds be open to the will of God and it comes into our hearts? Well, let's let Jesus explain how this happens. John chapter 6, verses 44 through 45. John 6, verses 44 through 45. How will God put his law in our minds and write it in our hearts? John 6, 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Verse 45. As it is written in the prophets, they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. That's how it happens. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. Romans 10 and verse 17. That's how God's law is put into our minds and written into our hearts. We read, we study, we take time to know God's will and it becomes a part of who we are because it becomes embedded in our minds. Question, are we spending time in study of God's Word? Every single day? As I often say, we make time for the things that are important to us. Are we spending time to allow God's Word that that God may place His law into our minds and write it into our hearts. It can't get into our minds or into our hearts unless we learn and we're taught. Christianity is a learned and taught religion. We must hear. Faith comes by hearing. That hearing becomes something that's in our minds and in our hearts. Then when we obey it, verse 33 of Jeremiah chapter 31, then we have that relationship with God. I will be their God, they shall be my people. And that, of course, happens through Jesus Christ, our mediator, our, our high priest, our king. We are the people of God and God shall be our, our, our God. But notice that happens when we have the law of God in our minds written in our hearts. We have to know God first believe in Him, obey Him, then we become the people of God, the church. Look at verse 34. 
No man, or excuse me, no, see, I told you I messed up. No more shall every man teach his neighbor or every man his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquities and their sins. I will remember no more. Now, verse 34 is an interesting verse here. You have to understand that under the old covenant, the law of Moses, the Hebrew children were born into that covenant. On the eighth day, the little Hebrew boy was circumcised. And then he had to grow up, the Hebrew girls had to grow up and learn about God. Learn that they were the people of God. They entered into the covenant first, and then as they grow up, they learn about God. In the New Testament, you can't be physically born into the church. You've got to be born again. That's exactly what Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. You have to be born again, born of water and the Spirit, if you want to enter into the kingdom of God. No person is naturally born into a situation in which they are a Christian. The little children of our congregation, the little infants, they're not Christians. Technically, they're not members of our congregation. They're innocent. Later on, when they, through their own actions, sin against God, and they obey the gospel, then they will be part of this fellowship as far as being a part of the church, members of the church, being the people of God. But now in their state of innocence, they don't need salvation. They're innocent. They have not yet sinned. They have to be taught first. In the New Testament, you have to be taught and know about God, know about Jesus Christ, know about the plan of salvation, know about His kingdom, then you obey the truth, then you become a part of the people of God. That's what he means when he says, all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. We don't baptize anyone we don't teach. We teach them that there is a God. Jesus Christ is his son. You have sinned against God. However, Jesus died for you. And if you obey his will, by his grace and mercy, you can be forgiven. As he says in verse 34, for I will forgive their iniquities and their sins. I will remember no more. That's justification. Forgiveness. Our sins are not held against us anymore through that one sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Look at Hebrews chapter 8. And we'll close with this. The author of the book of Hebrews is writing to Christians who were Jewish and he's talking about how that the New Testament, the New Covenant, is superior to the Old. Notice Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 6. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, talking about Christ, by as much as he is the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted on better promises. That's talking about the new covenant of Jeremiah 31. How do I know that? Look at verse 7. For if the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion sought for a second. For finding fault with them, he says, there's where the fault lies with people, not with God's will, not with God's word, with people who break the covenant. If you notice verse 8, he quotes from Jeremiah chapter 31, 31 through 34, all the way from verse 8 through verse 12. It's a word-for-word -word quotation from Jeremiah. Drop down to verse 13. When he said a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Whatever is being obsolete or becoming obsolete is growing old and is ready to vanish away. A new covenant that is established upon better promises. We have complete forgiveness of sins because we have one sacrifice, Jesus Christ. We have one high priest. We have one king. And that one gospel produces only one church. 
And we must be a part of that church, members of that church. As he describes it is as his people in Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 33. Christ in Jeremiah. He is that branch of righteousness that descended from David. He is the one who rules as king. He will save his people. He is the one by his death upon the cross. It brought an end to the old and brought about the new. The hard work's already been done. If you believe in him, confess that he's the son of God, repent of your sins, you're ready to be baptized. Immersed in water so the blood of Christ can take away all your sins and you'll become a part of his church, the people of God. If you've done that, you've gone astray, gone back into sin, we urge you to repent. As always, the choice is yours while we stand and while we sing.